Hey guys, it's your freaking favorite medical channel, Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our anesthesiology playlist. This is video number six. In video number one, we had a brief history of anesthesiology. Video number two, we talked about the basics. Video number three, general anesthetics, because we have intravenous and we have inhaled. Video number four, pharmacokinetics. Video number five, pharmacodynamics. And today, it's time to get serious and take care of the airway. An anesthesiologist who cannot manage the airway is like a mechanic who cannot change oil. Let's start by answering the question of the previous video. Oh, when adding opiates and benzodiazepines together to the same patient, you get what? You get synergistic effect, additive effect, or antagonistic effect. The answer is synergistic effect. But, 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 hey, medicosis, benzodiazepines and opiates are not acting on the same receptor. Who cares? Synergy doesn't have to be on the same receptor. Synergy has to be the same effect, the same end result. 1 plus 1 equals 3, which is a mathematical insanity, but a pharmacological reality. Anesthesia care phases. We have the preoperative phase, the intraoperative phase, and the postoperative phase. Preoperative, you evaluate, you choose, you pre-medicate. How should I evaluate them? Take a good history and physical exam. What kind of physical exam? Look at the teeth, look at the mouth, look at the length of their upper incisors. Ask them to open their jaw, close their jaw, and notice the movement of the maxillary and mandibular incisors when making a bite. Ask them to protrude their mandible forwards. Look at the distance between the incisors, aka the inter-incisors distance. Look at the palate, look at the uvula, the thickness of their neck, the length of their neck etc. It's very important to ask them about a cervical spine injury, especially at land to axial subluxation. Be careful in cases of rheumatoid arthritis, because if you're a doofus and you hyperextend their neck, ah, you may kill them or paralyze them. Be careful because there are some genetic diseases that can make your airway management difficult, especially Down syndrome. Why? They have macroglossia, large tongue. They have a small mouth. They have a small subglottic area or subglottic diameter. But it's not just Down syndrome. You also have Turner syndrome, Pierre Robbins syndrome, Kippel Thiel syndrome, Tricha Collins syndrome. Goldenar syndrome and others. And be careful, any condition that has micronathia or small chin can make your life difficult while trying to intubate. Next, you gotta decide and choose uh, which kind of anesthetic will you use. For example, I might choose propofol as my general anesthetic plus vicuronium as a neuromuscular blocker. Should I give them now? No, 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 you will not give them here. You will give them here. So we're just, we're just choosing in advance. It's called being prepared, baby. And then you pre-medicate. And your choices can include the benzodiazepines, the opioids, antihistamines, alpha-2 agonists, anticholinergics, etc. Intraoperatively, you monitor, you access, you plan. Monitor what? Physiological monitoring, the vital signs, all of them. Your EKG, oxygen saturation, this is just the minimum. Maintain a robust vascular axis and then plan. Are you doing general anesthesia or regional anesthesia? Of course, it depends on the freaking surgery. And it also depends on the patient. Let's say we're doing general today. Induction, maintenance, emergence. IME, IME. You do not just give the medication and run away. That's just the induction. Then you gotta maintain them during the surgery and make sure they wake up after the freaking surgery. After that, you control, you monitor, you dispose, control the pain, special monitoring, and then dispose, which means send the patient, send them where? You can send them home if it's a minor surgery and everything is hunky-dory. But if it's a severe thing, you can send them to the ICU, or if they need follow-up, send them to the post-anesthetic care unit or PACU. If you have watched my previous videos, you should have memorized this chart by now. Okay, medicosis, I prepared my patient. I gave propofol and I gave a neuromuscular blocker. Now what? Now you manage the airway. Let's go back to square one. Medicine is about ABCs. 
the airway, breathing and circulation. Hey Medicosis, I noticed a small mole on the patient's left toe. Oh, shut up. You first focus on the ABCs, airway, breathing and circulation. If you do not get your ABCs right first, the patient is gonna die while you keep arguing about the border irregularity of the freaking nevus. And here are the 10 commandments of airway management. This is good for surgery, it's good for emergency medicine, it's also good for anesthesia. Because a good rule is a good rule. It's not gonna become a bad rule just because you change departments in the freaking hospital. Rule number one, if the patient is conscious and speaking in a normal tone of voice, the airway is open as of this moment. This can change in the next second, so always be careful. If you have an expanding emphysema or hematoma it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, it can close the airway in the next minute. Thou shall secure the airway now before it's too late, baby. Rule number three, if the Glasgow coma scale is less than eight, you shall secure the airway runner. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, shut up. Secure it now. If the patient's breathing is noisy or gurgly, gur, 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 this is not cool. You should intervene right away. Secure the airway now. What if I suspect that this patient has a cervical spine injury or atlantoaxial subluxation? Thou shall secure the airway now before addressing the cervical spine injury. And you have two options. The first option is hard. You can secure and fix the head and avoid hyperextension. And then you endotracheally intubate. This is for the pros. Or you can do the easier out, which is intubation over a fiber optic bronchoscope. The problem is this takes a lot of time. So if this is an emergency, fiber optic is not an option. Assuming that this is an emergency situation, Rule number six, location, location, location. I sound like a real estate agent. If you're outside the hospital, thou shall secure the airway via cricothyroidotomy or intubation. But if you are in the hospital in the emergency room, thou shall secure the airway via rapid induction and endotracheal intubation. What if the patient has some serious facial injury and this is interfering with my intubation capabilities? Thou shall tracheate or cricothyroidotomy cricothyroidate. Tracheate is tracheostomy, cricothyroidate is cricothyroidotomy. If your patient is younger than 12 and you cannot intubate, thou shall tracheate. Try to avoid cricothyroidotomy. Most doctors are reluctant to do this in young kids because their vocal cords, their larynx are still growing. Infants, in general, are problematic. Why? The tongue is relatively large, the epiglottis is floppy, and the larynx is more anterior. Where is the narrowest part of the larynx? It's below the vocal cords. Number 10. Pregnant women, in general, are difficult to intubate. Why? Gravid uterus is pushing the diaphragm upwards, decreasing the FRC. What the flip is the FRC? Functional residual capacity. Go to my pulmonology playlist because I have a video about spirometry and the pulmonary function tests. The gravid uterus is pressing on the stomach, increasing the risk of aspiration. Oh, what's, what's aspiration? Aspiration is something that was not intended to go to the trachea, going into the trachea. Something could be from the mouth, it could be from the esophagus, from the stomach. When this happens to you while well, you're awake, this is happens, uh, let's say you are laughing while eating. <coughs> Why are you doing this? To prevent aspiration. Next, large breasts because of estrogen makes laryngoscopy more difficult. Also, there could be some airway edema. If you want to add commandment number 11, obesity is a risk factor. Obesity makes it difficult to intubate. So if the patient is morbidly obese, think of plan B before thinking of plan A. Airway technique, here's the deal. First, you go with mask ventilation. If you can maintain the patient mask ventilation, this is every anesthesiologist's dream come true. But unfortunately, it's sometimes it's not enough. Then you go to the next step. Next up is the tube. Of course, you have seen it before. The endotracheal tube. You intrude the tube through the mouth. It's called orotracheal. Or through the nose called nasotracheal. And ends up in the trachea. And this is how you make the patient breathe artificially during the freaking surgery. Can I use a laryngoscope? You can use it. Can you use a stylet? Yup, if you need it. What if this is hard? This is a difficult patient, difficult to intubate. Now it's time to shift to other techniques. So we go from this to this to this. 
try the fiber optic bronchoscope or the fiber optic endotracheal intubation. Okay, you can do it orally or nasally. And here is the unique thing about fiber optic. You can do it even when the patient is awake. And this luxury is not available for endotracheal intubation. The problem with fiber optic is that it takes a lot of time. And if you remember physics, fiber optic tubes depend on the character of light known as full reflection. This is how you get fast speed internet. If it's difficult to intubate the patient, you have other options such as retrograde tracheal intubation or blind nasotracheal intubation. Then you have supraglottic airway devices such as the famous LMA. Also, we have the ETC and others. And then if the bleep hits the fan and I cannot get the tube from above, I get a pierce through the patient's skin. And this is cricothyroidotomy or tracheal jet ventilation. Which one is better? Most of the time it's the cricothyroidotomy. Okay, medicosis, I'm trying to maintain an airway. What could possibly go wrong? Lots of stuff. Aspiration can happen. Dental trauma. You can damage the patient's teeth. Airway trauma. Anoxic brain injury. No oxygen to the brain because you, the patient is now paralyzed. Yep, because you gave general anesthetic and a neuromuscular blocker. If you can't manage the airway right now and the brain is not getting oxygen, you are in big trouble. Cardiopulmonary arrest can happen and if all of this fails, you will have to go through the trachea and pierce the skin of the patient, soft tissue, and then the trachea, so that's not fun. So I've told you about the genetic diseases that make your life difficult, such as Down syndrome, Turner syndrome, etc. Also, you have other diseases. Epiglottitis, we have talked about it before in my pulmonology playlist. Croup, Ludwig Angina, traumatic foreign body, obesity, goiter, or any mass, by the way. Cervical spine injury, such as atlantoaxial subluxation, which happens in rheumatoid arthritis, among others. Fractured base of the skull or basilar skull fracture, angioedema, laryngeal edema, hematoma, tumors, masses, systemic sclerosis, etc. Hematicosis, is there a way to try to guess and predict if this patient is going to be easy to intubate or difficult to intubate? Sure, we have two systems of classification. The first system is called malampati classification. What are we looking for? We're looking here. Look at this. This is the oropharynx. You're looking at the oropharyngeal opening. In class one, it is wide open, baby. Like when the anesthesiologist sees Malampati class one, the anesthesiologist is going to leave the patient, go to another room, and literally start dancing. Yay, I got class one. Then class two, it's getting narrower. Class three, even narrower. Class four, you can't even see it. That's not good. Next system of classification is the Colmic Lahane classification. What are we looking at? Are we looking at the oropharyngeal opening? No, 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 shut up. This is not the patient's mouth. This is the patient's vocal cords. And this is the vocal cord aperture. You're looking through the larynx and into the trachea. In grade one, oh, look, look at this. Everything is wide open. When the anesthesiologist sees this, oh my goodness, he's getting aroused. Then grade two, it's getting narrower and narrower, and you can't even see the opening. If this happens, the anesthesiologist goes to another room, starts weeping, crying, sprinkling some dust particles on his head, tearing apart his white coat, sitting shiva, and asking existential questions like, what is the purpose of life anyway? One patient, three axes. So here are the three axes. Oral axis, looking in the mouth. Okay, it's going this way. Pharyngeal axis is going to the pharynx. There is nasopharynx, there is oropharynx, there is laryngopharynx. And last, there is the laryngeal axis. Your job is to align them like a freaking mechanic. John F. Kennedy once said, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Beautiful. Medicosis says, don't assume that the main cause of the adverse outcome is your inability to place the endotracheal tube. That's not the main problem. The main problem is failure to oxygenate, failure to ventilate, and failure to prevent aspiration. This is the big deal. Is there a difference between oxygenation and ventilation? Absolutely. Ventilation happens first, then oxygenation is next. Ventilation is to get the air into the alveoli. 
and when the oxygen is in the alveoli, we call it P, big A, O2. Then after this, diffusion is going to happen, and the oxygen is going to leave the alveoli and go to the blood. And when it goes to the blood, first, it is freely floating in the blood, and we call this P, small a, O2. Then it jumps on the hemoglobin, and this is S, A, O2, and then the hemoglobin is going to give the oxygen to the tissue, and that's oxygenation. Of course, we have minute ventilation and alveolar ventilation, and please watch my pulmonology playlist to learn more. The pulse oximetry can help you assist oxygenation, but not the ventilation. Let's talk about mask ventilation. The mask should fit over the nasal bridge. The upper lip of the mask should be aligned with the patient's pupils. The lower lip should be seated between the chin and the lips. The sides of the mask should be seated lateral to the nasolabial folds. Of course, it helps if the patient has lupus. Oh, that's a terrible joke. I'm sorry. Then it's time to do a little jaw thrust. What the flip is that? With your fingers, lift the patient's lower jaw. And that's why during physical exam, we ask the patient to protrude the mandible voluntarily because we're gonna need it in the jaw thrust. Please be careful, do not press on the submandibular soft tissue, aka the hypopharynx. This can lead to airway obstruction. And this mask is connected to reservoir bag that you just keep pumping, pumping, pumping air into the patient. What are the predictors of a poor face mask ventilation? Old age, obesity, snoring, beard. Look at all of this beard action and lack of teeth because the beard action will give you inadequate positive pressure. However, the old age, obesity, and snoring will decrease the compliance and increase resistance. So what do the Hodge twins get? Inadequate positive pressure. It's time to talk about endotracheal intubation, aka classic direct laryngoscopy. Indications if the mask is not enough, if the patient needs to be in a position other than the supine position, because if the patient needs to be prone or on the side, you cannot use a mask. If the surgery site is near the upper airway, oh, you need to intubate, baby, provide an open airway. This prevents aspiration for the most part, and if you need frequent suctioning, endotracheal intubation is the way to go. Do not use the endotracheal tube if the patient has an unstable cervical spine, such as atlantoaxial subluxation, which happens in rheumatoid arthritis. If the patient is having an injury to an upper airway, uh, such as a severe maxillofacial trauma, it could be penetrating or blunt force, try to avoid the endotracheal tube. What should I do if I have any of these? Use a fiber optic technique. What is a laryngoscope? Laryngoscope is a device like this. It's a metal handle and it has a blade. What's the function of this? Holds the tongue in place, exposes the glottic opening so that you can introduce the tube like sharp knife through warm butter. The blade, like your underwear, comes in many sizes, shapes, and forms. Some of them are straight, some of them are curved, some of them are straight, but the tip is curved. If you have a problem, you can add a stylet. Slide something like this. Okay, and you have many types. You have the bougie, you have the shrouded stylet, the lighted stylet, let there be light, seeing optical stylets, or save our souls, no pun intended, frova intubating introducer. Okay, Medicosis, I've introduced the tube. How do I know that the tube is actually in the trachea, not in the esophagus? Well, clinically and radiologically. Clinically, compress the reservoir back. If the patient's chest is expanding and then relaxing, expanding and collapse, expand, then you know it's in the trachea, not the esophagus. Listen to the patient's chest. If you hear bilateral breath sounds, you are in a good shape. If the glass of the tube is fogging on expiration, that's a good sign. If there is carbon dioxide as the patient is expiring, that's a good sign. And you can use capnography. I love this word. Capno means what? You remember hypercapnia? Oh, capno means carbon dioxide. Measure the end tidal CO2. If it's greater than 30, for three to five consecutive breaths, that's amazing. It means that the tube has reached the trachea. Well done, doctor. Radiologically, just get an x-ray. 
The patient is difficult to intubate. What should I do? You have other options. Fiber optic techniques. You have fiber optic endotracheal intubation and fiber optic bronchoscope. We have indications and we have contraindications. The contraindications could be absolute. Absolutely no. No way. Or relative. Ah, uh, maybe I can use that. Indications. If it's difficult to intubate via direct laryngoscopy, the classic way, the endotracheal tube. Unstable cervical spine, injury to the upper airway. In other words, the contraindication of the classic direct laryngoscopy are the indications of the fiber optic one. How about contraindications? Absolute and relative. Absolute if you need an airway right now, because fiber optic techniques take a lot of time. Relative contraindications, any condition that decreases the space available, such as edema, a mass, a tumor, a goiter, a hematoma. Atlantoaxial subluxation or cervical spine instability is a huge topic, was discussed in my rheumatoid arthritis video in my rheumatology playlist. Why does rheumatoid arthritis affect the joint of Lushka between C1 and C2? Because this joint is, guess what? Synovial joint. And this is what rheumatoid affects. Medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Patient is difficult to intubate. You have other options. Fiber optic, retrograde, blind, supraglottic, such as the famous LMA. This is huge. The LMA has many types. Classical, the LMA, whatever, whatever, whatever. Why do we need them? If it is difficult to intubate, all right. And what do you do? It's a combination, use a combo, use two things together. The endotracheal tube plus the LMA. When you add them together, this combo gives you a very, very, very low risk of failure. Even if you're a doofus, you can get away with it. Everything has failed. The bleep has hit the fan. It's time to pierce the patient's skin, pierce the patient's subcutaneous tissue, pierce the freaking trachea or cricothyroid cartilage. Cricothyroidotomy, tracheal jet ventilation or tracheostomy. Which one is better? Usually cricothyroidotomy. Why? Definitive airway for 72 freaking hours. That's huge. It allows for both inhalation and exhalation. It does not depend on the patient's native airway, unlike the tracheal jet ventilation. Of course, you only use the transtracheal techniques if it's a freaking emergency, if you could not secure the airway otherwise. Now the surgery is over. Congratulations. Time to get the tube out. When should I do it? When the patient is deeply anesthetized or when the patient is fully awake. Never do it in between. Never do it when the patient is kind of sort of ish. Lightly anesthetized. This is, that's, that's horrible. That's like dancing on the stairs. Either go up or go down. Don't, don't dance in the middle. How do I know that the patient is dancing in the middle? The patient is not upstairs and not downstairs. How do you know that? The patient is coughing. The patient can hold his breath. The patient has disconjugate gaze. However, the patient cannot fully respond to commands. This is when you know that the patient is not fully awake. How do I do it? Start spontaneous ventilation, breathing with pure oxygen. Make sure that the neuromuscular blockers effect is fully, fully reversed. Suction, extubate while delivering a positive pressure breath. Do you want the airway to collapse? Do you want laryngospasm? No, add a positive pressure. Please note, if the patient is reaching for the endotracheal tube, this does not necessarily mean that the patient is fully awake. This could be just a reflex. A patient who is fully awake is fully responding to commands. Open your eyes, close your eyes. Look to the right, look to the left. Raise your right arm, raise your left arm. What are the complications of tracheal intubation? Lots and lots of complications. During intubation, while the trachea is in place or after extubation. During intubation, oral trauma, dental trauma, aspiration, hypertension, tachycardia, myocardial infarction. While the trachea is in the place, esophagus. Oh, I hit the esophagus. Oops, I am in the endobronchial tree. Wow. Tracheal tube obstruction, tracheal tube cuff leak, pulmonary barotrauma, pressure trauma, nasogastric distension, accidental disconnection between the tube and the breathing circuit. That's not fun. This is like cutting the cord. Accidental extubation like an absolute doofus. After tracheal 
extubation, the patient can aspire. You can get pharyngitis, laryngitis, laryngospasm, laryngeal ulceration, laryngeal edema, tracheitis, tracheal stenosis, vocal cord dysfunction, dislocation of the arytenoid cartilage. Remember that vocal cord dysfunction will give you this shape on flow volume loops. Watch my pulmonology playlist, please. Complications of extubation in infants and children. Some infants during extubation can suffer from croup or striders. The tube was too big for them. Pressure on the tracheal mucosa. And when you press on the veins, they get distended proximally and you get edema. Edema is pressing on my airways, decreasing the radius. When you decrease the radius, you increase the resistance, but it's to the fourth power. How do I treat this disaster? If it's mild, humidified oxygen and observe at the PACU. But if it's severe, aerosolized racemic epinephrine, please watch the previous video to know why we call it racemic, and observe the patient in the freaking ICU. This is serious stuff. The patient's not improving yet. Unfortunately, we get a reintubate in the operating room. And this time, please learn from your mistake and use a smaller endotracheal tube, you absolute doofus. To learn the difference between croup and epiglottitis, watch my pulmonology playlist. Pause and review. If you want an algorithm for difficult airway management, check out this website. Question of the day. Should I pre-medicate the patient just to prevent aspiration? Yes or no? If you like this video, you will adore my antihepatics course, available at medicosisperfectionetics.com. I also have a chemotherapy course, no pun intended. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Thank you for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionatus, where medicine makes perfect sense.